The U.S. was once a small corner of the British Empire, which ended up becoming the richest and most powerful country in the world, even after fighting a civil war and suffering through constant economic crises early on. To find out why, join me for this brief look at the history and politics of the United States. We do not know much about the earliest people in the U.S., not even when they first showed up in what is now American territory. The current accepted theory is that the Ice Age created a land bridge across the Bering Strait which allowed people to migrate from Siberia at least 17,000 years ago. But new research suggests it might have happened much earlier and not necessarily through Alaska. These migrants then began populating the rest of the Americas and adapting to their environment. Over thousands of years, this adaptation gave rise to distinct cultural zones which all had differing lifestyles. The Northwest cultures, for instance, lived mostly off of salmon, berries, and shellfish, and are best known for their totem pole art, which had both cultural and religious uses. The Northeast peoples were semi-nomadic, living off of the hunting of game, beans, corn, and squash, and dwelled in wigwams, or longhouses, depending on the season. The people of the plains were nomadic, moving along with the herds of American bison, which provided most of their sustenance. The people of California lived in much smaller groups and lived mostly off of fish, berries, and nuts, especially the acorn, which was a staple of their diet. The people of the southeast lived off of corn, pumpkins, and sunflowers and were known for their circular houses and earth mounds, of which many still survive. Finally, the people of the southwest also relied on beans, corns, and squash and are best known for their cliff dwellings, which they carved into the sides of canyons all over New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, etc. Their hierarchical complexity also differed across the country. The largest and most complex civilization north of Mexico was that center around Cahokia, a settlement founded sometime around 650 AD in what is now Illinois, just east of St. Louis, which at its height housed some 1,000 individuals. Historians variously estimate that between 1 and 2 million natives lived in current American territory at the end of the 15th century. Their lives would completely change with the arrival of the Europeans to the Americas in 1492. That's because the land that is now the United States became bitterly disputed territory among various European powers, including the Spanish, French, Dutch, English, Russians, and even Swedish. The Spanish came first. They sailed north from the Caribbean strongholds and had multiple extensive expeditions that encompassed most of the territory between Southern Virginia and California, as well as parts of Alaska. They were also the first Europeans to attempt to settle in future American mainland when they established San Miguel de Gualdape in 1526, a colony in what is now the South Carolina coast. This one failed though, as did a Jesuit post further north in Virginia in 1570, the colony of Ajacán. Instead, the Spanish domain would be limited to Florida and most of the southwest. These Spanish possessions were never as important as their Latin American strongholds, but they founded a number of cities including the first permanent European settlement in the American territory. St. Augustine, as well as cities that would later become more prominent including Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, Santa Fe, Tucson, Pensacola, San Antonio, and so on. Next came the French, who also had a number of failed settlements in the 16th century in South Carolina and Florida. France had to wait until the 17th century when its more consolidated Canadian colony allowed them to establish settlements in modern-day Michigan, Wisconsin, and Vermont, and later as the result of the exploration of the Mississippi to outposts in Mississippi and Alabama, and especially to the jewel of their American possessions, New Orleans in 1718. Russia, Sweden, and the Netherlands also established colonies. In 1614, the Dutch founded New Netherland, a colony based around the Hudson River and its capital, New Amsterdam, later renamed New York. Sweden followed up with their own settlements along the Delaware River in 1638 in a colony they called Niasveria, or New Sweden, while the Russians laid claims to all of Alaska and had posts in Hawaii and one in California. For future American history, however, the more important colonies were the English, which were founded along the Atlantic, starting with Jamestown, Virginia in 1607 and Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts in 1620. The motivation and mode of colonization differed across the European colonies, but it was particularly so in the English ones, which from very early on developed distinct political and cultural outlooks. Virginia and Massachusetts, for example, although both private enterprises sanctioned by the king, had very different rationales. Virginia had more commercial goals, while Massachusetts aimed at providing Puritans, a religious minority in England, a safe space to practice their version of Christianity. This, in turn, would lead to the development of tobacco and cotton as cash crops, which would eventually lead to the importation of enslaved Africans to Virginia at a disproportionate rate, not just there, but also its neighboring southern colonies. The presence of so many competing interests naturally led to conflict. 
on the one hand between the natives and the European powers, and on the other between the Europeans themselves. In the latter case, one of the earliest was between the Dutch and the Swedish, the former of which managed to incorporate Niesveria into New Netherland in 1655. This arrangement barely lasted, however. A war between Britain and the Netherlands soon transferred the Dutch colony to British authority in 1674. The Spanish had their own conflict with Britain and France over border disputes in Texas and Florida, but the largest and most violent of all was between the English and the French, the strongest powers of the time. For over a century, starting in the mid-1600s, they fought over North America, resulting in multiple wars, the most important of which was the 1750s version, known in Britain and the U.S. as the French and Indian War. This was the most significant because it turned out to be so decisive. In the Treaty of Paris in 1763, France ceded its North American possessions east of the Mississippi River to Britain and west to Spain. The consolidation of Britain's authority in North America did not have the happy ending the Crown was expecting, however. The British Parliament passed a series of acts intended to pay for the cost of the war, a reasonable way for the American colonists to contribute to their own security, or so the British thought. Instead, the colonies found them intolerable and began different forms of resistance, especially in Massachusetts, where the Boston Tea Party, a particularly destructive protest in 1773, sparked British fury and led to increased military suppression. This, in turn, paved the way for violence when, in April 1775, a group of Patriot militias confronted British regulars tasked with destroying their military supplies in what came to be known as the Battle of Lexington and Concord. The American Revolution had begun. A little over a year later, the rebel colonies declared themselves independent with a rhetorical flourish that still echoes centuries later. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Still, words were one thing. Facing the most powerful army in the world at the time was another. It helped that the Americans had massive popular support, the home advantage so they could use guerrilla tactics, and most importantly, the help of France, Spain, and the Netherlands, who tipped the balance for independence. And thus, six years after the original battles in Massachusetts, and after the deaths of a combined 50,000 people for both sides, the British finally surrendered to George Washington after the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. Kicking out the British was the least of it, however. It was still the matter of creating a cohesive national government that could bring prosperity and withstand future British invasions. The challenge, however, was that one of their main motivations for the revolution had been distrust of central authority. So the new independent colonies, now states, opted for a system known as the Articles of Confederation that severely limited the central government and essentially granted a veto to any member over national policy. It was a disaster. So much so that within six years, a convention was held to write a new constitution that created a much stronger national government and unified the states into a single market. The effort was still met with suspicion. So a pro-constitution essay campaign, dubbed the Federalist Papers, was instituted, and most importantly, a group of amendments intended to explicitly protect people from government abuse, today collectively known as the Bill of Rights, were added. This, coupled with the fact that people trusted George Washington, the potential new president, not to abuse his power, led to the Constitution's ratification by all states by 1790. Even better, in 1793, a British immigrant, Samuel Slater, began the American Industrial Revolution when he developed the first mechanized textile mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, something that soon spread to other states. Buoyed by its economy, the U.S. soon encountered another unexpected opportunity in 1803. Napoleonic France, in need of funds, decided to sell its Louisiana claims to Jefferson and the Americans, themselves in French hands because of Spain's ill-advised changing European alliances. The purchase not only doubled the country's size, but began the United States' expansionist phase. In only 50 years, the entire territory that makes up the modern continental U.S. had been acquired, purchased, or negotiated. Motivated by what came to be known as Manifest Destiny, a big chunk of the territory had come from a war with Mexico. Itself, as a result of disputed territory, after Texas, a breakaway Mexican province, was annexed in 1845. The rest was either purchased or taken from Spain or Britain. This brought new resources to the country, such as when gold was discovered in California in 1848, but the massive new territory also vastly complicated domestic politics. Through the first half of the 19th century, the use of black and slave labor had been expanded all over the South as the demand for cotton and cheap free land exploded and brought much wealth to the region's plantation owners. A different pattern developed in the North as industrialization and climate created the opposite incentives. Moreover, the brutality of the slavery system generated deep moral opposition that took root in the North in the form of the abolitionist movement. 
These differences translated to contrasting political outlooks, polarized the country, and became harder to manage in Congress. One way politicians looked to balance these interests was through the maintenance of equal slave and free states in the Union. Thus, whether slavery should be permitted in the new territories became the political question of the time. An agreement in 1820, later expanded with the Missouri Compromise in 1850, restricted the expansion of slavery north of the 36 degree and a half parallel. But in 1854, in an effort to facilitate the construction of a transcontinental railroad, Senator Stephen Douglas passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which legally opened the Kansas Territory to slavery, as long as it had the backing of its population. This led to pro- and anti-slavery migrants to move to the area, leading to violence between them in a series of clashes that came to be known as Bleeding Kansas. One of the people involved was John Brown, a staunch abolitionist from Connecticut who would later lead an ill-fated attempt to start a revolt in Virginia. Eventually, Kansas was admitted as a free state in January 1861, but the act exacerbated the country's polarization, destroyed one of the country's two main parties, the Whigs, and opened the way for a staunchly anti-slavery party, the Republicans. When the Republican nominee, Abraham Lincoln, was elected in November 6, 1860, the southern states saw him as a serious threat to slavery. Only four days later, South Carolina called for a convention to consider secession and formally voted for it December 17th of that year. They were soon joined by the rest of the Deep South, who in February of 1861 organized themselves into a new government known as the Confederate States, whose cornerstone, as the Vice President Alexander Stevens declared, was white supremacy. Faced with a secession crisis, Lincoln sent troops in April 1861 to try and protect federal property in South Carolina. Instead, the locals immediately cut off Fort Sumter supply lines and fired their artillery until the Union garrison surrendered. The first shots of the Civil War, the deadliest conflict in American history, had been fired. The Confederacy had the early advantage, especially since they had Robert E. Lee on their side, while the Union generals kept making mistake after mistake. The North's economic advantage, numerical superiority, and leadership from Ulysses S. Grant eventually made the difference, however, and by April 1865, the Confederacy was forced to surrender. Still, military victory brought its own challenges. For one, Lincoln was assassinated on April 14th by a Confederate sympathizer, an actor named John Wilkes Booth. This left Andrew Johnson in the presidency, a Southerner who saw little reason to punish the South. For another, there was the matter of what to do with the formerly enslaved. Lincoln had issued an Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, and the 13th Amendment had abolished slavery in January of 1865, but federal support to transition to a reasonably prosperous life was never enough in practice, especially with Johnson in charge. This, coupled with violence from white Southerners, made the war's aftermath a period known as Reconstruction, a process by which white supremacy was reinstated as the cultural, political, and economic logic of the region. Elsewhere, the economy boomed. The end of slavery paved the way for the incorporation of Western resources to Eastern markets with the building of the Transcontinental Railroad in May 1869, and even opened up the opportunity for further expansion. Alaska was bought from Russia, for example. This, in turn, meant a systematic attempt at displacing indigenous peoples from their traditional Western lands. Natives east of the Mississippi had already suffered violence and displacement, most notoriously during the Trial of Tears, which forcibly removed the Cherokees from the southeast starting in 1830. This continued that process. There was native resistance, of course, most famously by Sitting Bull and Geronimo, Lakota and Apache leaders respectively, and there were even some memorable victories such as the destruction of Custer's regiment at the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876, but by the 1890s, armed resistance had been crushed and was limited to small, isolated raids while most natives had been placed in reservations. They would not even be considered citizens until 1924. The postbellum prosperity gave way to a period known as the Gilded Age, an era best known for massive European immigration, industrial consolidation, and the expansion of technological advances such as railroads and telegraphs that made a few men very, very rich, including J.P. Morgan, Andrew Carnegie, and of course John D. Rockefeller who became the wealthiest American of all time. The resulting inequality sparked a new age, dubbed the Progressive Era, where social mobilization brought anti-monopoly regulation, the direct election of senators, the legalization of women's suffrage, and the strengthening of the labor movement. Simultaneously, the country became increasingly powerful in global affairs. It continued its territorial expansion, annexing Hawaii and gaining several Spanish territories, including Guam, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, after a war with Spain in 1898. Its true emergence as a global power, however, occurred in 1917 when the U.S. opted to enter World War I on the side of Britain and France and decisively turned the tide of the war in their favor. 
This increased global importance for the United States was temporarily halted when the country's stock market crashed in 1929, precipitating a massive economic shock that saw 29% reduction in real GDP and a huge unemployment rate of 25% by 1933. The U.S. under President FDR tried to ameliorate the economic misery of the Great Depression with extensive government programs known as the New Deal, but the economic slowdown ended up lasting a decade. In the end, what got the United States out of the ditch was the government spending that became necessary because of World War II, itself the indirect result of the Depression. Just as in World War I, the U.S. was not one of the war's original combatants, but decided to enter the global conflict only after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Victory had a much higher cost, however. It took over three times as many American lives and the need to drop two nuclear bombs on Japan to end the war. But in the end, the U.S., along with its ally, the Soviet Union, emerged as the clear undisputed superpowers. The understanding between the United States and the USSR barely lasted, however. Mutual misunderstanding, ideological differences, and geopolitical concerns turned the alliance into a cold war, where the primary goal the U.S. set for itself was the stop of the spread of communism. This translated to a lot of wars in distant places like Korea and Vietnam, but also investment into higher education, NASA, and military technology in general, in an effort to beat the Soviets. That government strategy landed a man on the moon, led to all sorts of spin-off technologies like GPS, solar cells, and even ARPANET, the foundation of what later became the internet, bringing economic growth to the country in general in the 1950s and 1960s. Of course, not everyone got to share equally in that prosperity. In the South, Jim Crow, a legal discrimination system set up to prevent black people from ever gaining much power, closed down most social mobility avenues for non-whites. Elsewhere, similar laws meant that non-whites disproportionately ended up in inferior housing. Women as a whole, meanwhile, also faced all sorts of legal obstacles, including in their ability to get a divorce, maintain their job if they got pregnant, or even get a credit card. As a result, for the next two decades, the country experienced a massive mobilization and widespread political activism in favor of civil rights and other vulnerable minorities under the leadership of people like Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Gloria Steinem, Cesar Chavez, Dennis Banks, and many more besides. This activism was accompanied by a wider cultural revolution in gender roles, sexual attitudes, and social norms, which brought changes in music, art, and film. By the late 1970s, the U.S. was a far less conservative place than it had been at the end of World War II. This, in turn, brought a conservative backlash that managed to elect Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush. With a very brief interlude for the Democratic presidency of Jimmy Carter, who was elected in the wake of a massive scandal known as Watergate, when Nixon opted to illegally spy on his opponents. Republican rule could not turn back broader cultural changes, but it did end the Democratic coalition that had been sustained since the New Deal, with an appeal to lower taxes for the rich and cuts to the welfare state to turbocharge the economy. This general outlook prevailed even when a new Democrat, Bill Clinton, was elected in 1992 and continued with his successor, George W. Bush, who made it central to his campaign to continue cutting taxes. The economic results were uneven, with notable growth under Reagan and Clinton, but increasing inequality. The 9-11 terrorist attacks at the beginning of W. Bush's presidency changed the conversation entirely. May 41, the president with the highest recorded approval rating ever, at 90%, and ensured his re-election. But his ill-advised invasion of Iraq and a new economic crisis in 2008 ensured that Republicans would not be elected for a third term. Instead, hope was set in Barack Obama, the junior senator from Illinois, who had gained political notoriety only four years earlier with a speech at the Democratic Convention. His honeymoon was brief, however, he sparked massive Republican opposition, and although he was able to be re-elected, his imprint on the country was far less than what had seemed possible in 2008. This was especially so because his successor ended up being Donald Trump, a TV personality few people expected to win, including himself. The new president immediately set out to undo Obama's policies, especially around immigration, polarizing the country even more than his predecessor had, and so was out after a single term. The man that replaced him was Obama's VP, Joe Biden, the oldest person to ever be elected president, 47 years after he was first elected senator and 32 years after his first run for the presidency. Currently, the country is enjoying an economic rebound after the COVID debacle, but it still faces any number of challenges, including inequality, the cost of housing, aging infrastructure, and perhaps most importantly, an increasingly dysfunctional political process, 
the U.S. seems to be in the cusp of dramatic change. Whether that will be for the better or not remains to be seen.